you would be our teacher today. Let all hear that there is one name given among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name of Jesus. Let someone hear today, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let that name be the magnetic force to draw all to you, O Lord. We hear your word, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Let someone hear today that there is that one name. We celebrate the name of Jesus. Speak now, O oh Lord, through your word. Let someone say, yes, I believe. Someone, I need a family. I need to be restored to fellowship. I need the prayers of the righteous. Then, Lord, edify the body. Build up the believer. Do it all today. Heal, strengthen every name on the sick and shut-in list. You know that name. You know that need. Raise up that brother. Raise up that sister. We lift up every believer everywhere. We lift up our president. We lift up President Obama. We pray for his administration. We pray for the Congress. We pray for governors and mayors. We lift up these men and women. Give them wisdom. Give them judgment. Give them what they need to make good decisions. We lift up America today in the name of Jesus. Thank you for so many soldiers coming home. Thank you, O oh Lord, for freedom and faith. Thank you for family. All these good gifts we receive from your loving hand. We ask these petitions now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The word of the Lord is drawn from Galatians chapter 5. New Testament epistle to the churches of Galatia, chapter 5. Would you stand all over the sanctuary, Galatians chapter 5, as we reverence our God in the reading of his word, Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. 13 again, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Freedom fights the flesh. Freedom fights the flesh. The Apostle Paul wrote to many believing communities. He wrote what are called epistles, letters designed to give a biblical and theological foundation and then present the ethical application. His pattern in writing to the believers in far-flung places around Asia Minor was to start with principle and then move to practice, to start with doctrine and then give duty, to fortify beliefs and then move to behavior to tell us all we have in Christ and then encourage us to live for Christ. He had this paradigm, this model, this example that he gave to believers. He started with the 
principle and then shifted into the practice. He started with a foundation of faith so that the people of God could understand what their responsibility was. Four chapters leading into today's text are all dedicated to the proposition that reconciliation to God is by faith through grace that humanity has been justified by God. That it is not a matter of what we have done, but it is a celebration of the finished sacrificial work of Christ on Calvary's cross. That our best task is to confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead. But the emphasis is not on what we do, it is what he has already done through Christ. The Apostle Paul is insistent that there is only one way to God and that way inevitably leads through his son Jesus. He has been provoked by some Judaizers. They are radical in their teaching that we must keep the law and particularly the law being seen, manifested, displayed in circumcision. A male being put in a place where he was more like the Jews in order to come to Christ. But friends, today you and I need to know that there is no intermediary between us and our embrace of Jesus Christ. You don't have to do anything but open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word of God teaches us that if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, thou shall be saved. So we are insistent today along with the Apostle Paul, and Paul recognized, listen, that the law was a mirror, but it was a mirror that could only show us our deficiencies. It could in no wise do anything about those deficiencies. Whereas Christ came to not only show us how far we fell short of God's glory, but to make up the difference. For Paul, the emphasis was not Mount Sinai, the law, but the emphasis was Mount Calvary, where God dispatched grace. Not Mount Sinai, where the law was given to Moses, but Mount Calvary, where The Son of God died for our sins. So we have today this matter of freedom. Freedom in the sense that every one of our sins was nailed to the cross. So in one sense, Paul says, believers have freedom. I read Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, for you were called to freedom. The idea being that you and I, every one of our sins was forgiven. Our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, because Christ completely did everything necessary. And so one of the final words from the cross of Calvary was Jesus saying, it is finished. Everything necessary for salvation has been completed. So now we bring to your attention today the idea, the concept of freedom. A believer is not under any code that would impress God. Instead, a believer has been made acceptable with God because he or she confessed Christ as Savior. Now when we say that, Freedom sounds as if there is no parameter, nothing that holds the believer in check. I made, a commit, I made a comment that I'm sure was troubling when you hear a minister say, which I did say, that I do not live according to the Ten Commandments. Let that settle in. 
that you just heard a preacher say that my code of conduct is not the Ten Commandments. Because what we discovered in our study of Galatians is if you want to go by the way of the law, you must keep every aspect of the law. And not only are there ten commandments, but when you really get to the law matter, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they had piled on so many other teachings and laws that it was now up to about 631 different things you had to do. Now, friends, no one is justified by the law of God. The illustration is the law is a mirror. The mirror shows you the smudges. The mirror shows you all of the defects. But the mirror has no mechanism to reach out of itself and clean up what it has shown you. The necessity is that Christ would come and when the mirror of the law shows us our defects, Christ comes along and fulfilling the law, he does what the law could not do in that the law was weak. He changes the scenario for the believer. So when I tell you that we have freedom, it sounds as if there are no guidelines. You just live your life. You just do anything, Reverend? Well, come on now. Well, no, not license. And on the other hand, not legalism. Because legalism is a litany of do's and don'ts. And friends, I might be talking to somebody today who has moved beyond the word of God that you have a whole list of what you don't do, where you don't go, what you don't have any fellowship with. And all of those are good things, but that's not the best code whereby you live your life. If it's not legalism, if it's not license, well, where are we? Well, there's another word. And Paul says it's love. Love holds freedom in check. Freedom fights against the flesh. Let me get to a couple of things I want to put before you. Number one, Paul says... Christ has made us free. But do not use your freedom for an opportunity for the flesh. Let's unpackage this word flesh, sarkonos. The idea in the Greek is that it's, it's, the, it's the unredeemed nature of humanity. Ah, I want to pray. I want to put before someone today that 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 we were saved. And those of us who know Christ as Savior had an old Adamic, evil, sinful nature. And Christ came with a renewed, redeemed nature. And through the blood of Jesus, we now as believers have two natures. Now, this is called a teaching message, so you need to get this. In Romans chapter 7, if you have just a real quick moment, Romans chapter 7, Paul, Paul who knows Christ, Paul who has been redeemed by Christ, Paul who has been called on the road to Damascus is telling us about his Christian life. Listen to him in Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, 17, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Paul is talking, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish I would do, I do not. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. Sounds like a man with a problem. Sounds like, if you and I are honest, our own testimony. 
that our problem is with this flesh. It's this old nature that when I would do good, when I would do something that brings glory to God, my flesh keeps pulling on me. I'm talking to myself today, but let me preach to myself that this flesh problem, that I know I'm free in Christ, but the flesh keeps pulling back that Oh, nature, it is not eliminated when you accept Christ. A new nature moves in, and they are at war with one another. And whichever I feed grows. That's why prayer, the word worship, commitment to God, obedience to God, all of those build up the new nature. Got to starve the old nature. Give it no attention. Give it no time. Give it nothing. Starve it. And then see what God does with the new nature. So now we have a problem. Number one, the flesh can never be satisfied. Our flesh always wants more. There are some people here today, you know, you don't need that next slice of pie. But the flesh is never satisfied. I wanted to use one of those that's neutral, that, you know, you know, everybody knows about pie. The thinnest among us, me, I could eat another piece of pie, but it wouldn't be helpful. You wouldn't see the effects maybe for a little while because of my metabolism. But the point I'm making is that all of us know that the flesh is always trying to push us. And freedom in Christ has to fight against the flesh. I know I'm free. It's not a sin to eat it. But the implications of eating it will be with me. I've been saved. Forgiven. But I don't want to glorify flesh. Let's deal with Ten Commandments real quick. The flesh has to be denied. In every one, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not kill, commit adultery. All of them are real, and I'm not minimizing anyone. I'm simply saying if you fail in one, the Bible says, you have failed in all. Well, don't even try. No, that's not what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to get to something deeper. As the preacher says, let me go deeper. You got freedom. But you also have a fight. And the fight is not with somebody else. The fight is with your own flesh. Talk about the temptation to talk about somebody. I just got to tell it. I heard it and I just got to tell somebody. That's your flesh. And flesh has to be denied. Number one, the flesh can never be satisfied. Let's, let's look at number two. Love is the determining factor in our relationship with God. If you need a code of conduct, here it is. I want to live in such a way that God is pleased because I love God. I need to, I need to play on the keyboard of your mind one more time. If you love God, that's the reason that you want to be obedient. Not because God's going to get you in the exact moment that you do wrong, because enough of us know that God's grace winks sometimes at flagrant wrong. It's not that God does not see it. He just gives us a little more time to get it right, to straighten it out, to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to re act according to the word of God because the flesh keeps pushing you up. You're free. You're free. You're free. You've been saved. You've been forgiven. You're free. You don't have to pray uh, to ask God to forgive you. There's a millisecond where you have a way out. There's a millisecond where every believer has a way of escape. But the flesh tells you don't even worry about it. It's covered by the blood of Jesus. 
I want you to hear me today. I've been a preacher for many decades, three plus decades, and I preach Jesus, that he is the only way to salvation. I preach that we are covered by the blood of Jesus. I preach that we want to live lives as believers in ways that please our heavenly Father. I do not believe, according to the word of God, that because you start doing good things that you get a new car, a new house, a new uh, uh, wardrobe. I believe based on grace, God does what he does because you have to answer the question, if God gives you blessings on the basis of being good, does God take back when you act up? Love is the determining. How do I know that? Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says, listen, don't try to figure out all of the law now that has been brought together, all the rabbinical traditions, all the Pharisees, all the Sadducees, all what the scribes have said, what they found that needed to be in the law. He said, let's sum it up. Let's put the law in one little statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Think about what Christian living would be like if everybody just thought about other people. You want to know how to act? You trying to find a rule book? I got one simple one from the Word of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I want to give you a definition of love, and I want to tell you ahead of time what love is not. Then we'll get to what love is. Love is not you hang up. No, you hang up. Love is not I wake up in the morning and I think about you. I go to bed at night thinking about you. Ooh, that's so sweet. That's sentimentality. Ooh, I just want to get with you. Yeah, the preacher just said that. Uh, that's not love. Love, if you want to know it, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's turn to it real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to know what the Bible says about love. Because Jesus said, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. Jesus said, by this shall all men know, John 13, 35, that you are my disciples. I'm a Bible preacher, so I want to give you a lot of Bible. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's see what love is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Does not seek its own, is not provoked. Are, are, are you loving people? Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Ouch. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, check you, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. How, how does love look now? Now, apply all of that in your relationship to your neighbor. Pastor, how does this connect with the message? Well, freedom has to fight the flesh. And freedom fights with love. That, that there's some things you could say, but love won't let you. There's some places you could go, but love won't let you. There's some attitudes you could adopt, but love will not allow it. Love for God, love for my neighbor. Freedom has to fight against the flesh, and freedom fights with love. Do you want to know what love is a little more? 
Jesus said that a man fell among some thieves on a Jericho road. And he said several people came by. He said a Levite came by. He said a priest came by. And then a hated Samaritan. But the Samaritan didn't ask the brother who had been beaten and stripped and robbed. He didn't ask him his ethnicity, his culture, his political values. He didn't ask him his economic status. He didn't ask him where he was from. He didn't ask him about his lineage. He didn't ask him about his political affiliations. He didn't ask him if he had a voter registration card. He just picked the man up. He bandaged him up, put him on his beast of burden, took him to the inn, pulled out his credit card, told the man at the inn, take care of him, and whatever it is, I'll pay it upon my return. That's love. You want a code of conduct. How do you live? You're trying to live by the law. I don't think you can do it. Because you got to do the whole law. If you fail in one iota, it's as if you fa failed in the whole keeping of the law. Let's not talk about law. Let's talk about grace. I ought to hear about grace every now and then from the pulpit of the Christian church. There ought to be a word about grace. There's enough words about what you did right and what you accomplished because your faith did it. But I want to talk about what grace does when you don't even have faith to reach. Love, number three, does not devour. Come on back to Galatians chapter 5. Listen to the word of God because Paul says something that we need to hear. Galatians chapter 5, are you there? Look at verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. This is a weird question, but I want to ask it. Have you ever been bit? Ah, oh, you're thinking about, he loves me so much. Look at that mark on my neck. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Monkey bite, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But the one I really want to talk about is when you've been talked about. And you know that you did nothing to receive such words. That's the tendency of believers to bite one another. And the Apostle Paul says that's freedom, but it's not held in check by love. Because there are certain things you cannot say because words are very powerful. The proverb writer said death and life are in the power of the tongue. There are some people who have been there are some people who have been almost devoured, that they have been talked about, slandered, libeled, lied on, mistreated, because somebody was not concerned about biting and devouring. And Paul says, be careful because you could easily be consumed. Where is Sister Smith? We ate her last week. Where's Brother X? We chewed him up. Talked about his suit. Talked about his wife. Talked about his shoes. Talked about his hair. Talked about his teeth. You don't realize God, through Christ, forgave each of us. And some people are gone because they've been consumed. Her dress was too high, and so we ate her up. Flouncing herself around here, don't she know that men don't want to see her? They might. Maybe they shouldn't. But you can't speak for the men. But don't bite. Don't bite. Don't put your mouth on somebody. 
You don't know what God is doing with somebody. You got to be careful. You got to give somebody some latitude to grow up in Christ. You were not always where you are in Christ. Somebody had to hold their tongue. Somebody could have bit you a long time ago and you would have been devoured but the grace of God would not allow them love said be quiet love said another chance love said I won't say what I'd like to say I want to live a Christian life on the basis of love. He contextualizes it by saying this, brethren, brethren. Let me, see, let me see if I can put this in real quick on my way to the last point. He says this, because you're in the same family, there's some things that you don't say about a sibling because that's family. There's some people, you, you know, we got that, we got plenty of dozens, but there's some people who have hurt you about a family member. In other words, I know his problem, but I can't let it get outside of the family circle. So that's why sometimes if you're going to talk about somebody, this is just a word to the wise. You shouldn't talk about anybody, but you better check to find out, is this your cousin? Is this your nephew? Because you just might be talking about the wrong person. I mean, he's a rascal in the family. We hide our purses and we hide our wallets when he comes around. We know his problem. But don't you start talking about him. That's my cousin. That's my nephew. That's my brother. That's my sister. And you know it in the natural. So you got to bring it over to the spiritual realm. I love you and I got to protect you in Christ. How do you live your life? Here it is. Walk by the Spirit. Nullify the flesh. Don't you wish you could kill the flesh once and for all? So tomorrow, tomorrow when you're not in church, Tomorrow, when you're not under the aura of the anointing, tomorrow, when, when you're back in the flesh, Tomorrow, when somebody gets on your last nerve, tomorrow, when you got to deal with the negativity all around you, tomorrow, don't you wish you could just slay the flesh one time? And the Apostle Paul says, you wish you could, but you can't. The flesh, this ain't heavy, but this is at least illustrative. The flesh is like that old monster movie. When they believe that little girl is on the phone and she believes that the monster, uh, Jason or whoever, with the mask, the ski mask, is, is dead and Jason keep coming back. How many Friday the 13th have we already had? The flesh is like that. You think you can slay it, but the flesh has more lives than any cat. The flesh. Paul said, I find a law. It's this flesh. Well, what's the antidote? Walk by the Spirit. Now, friends, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's not the third God. He's not one of three gods. He is God. We know of God as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God. The Holy Spirit is a person. We do not speak of the Holy Spirit as it, cast but a friendly ghost. No, the Holy Spirit is an intelligent God, like unto the Father, like unto the Son. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. He is the indwelling presence of the believer. He guides us into our ways. The reason you do what you do is because the Spirit guides you. Here is the prayer that I would suggest you pray every day. Holy Spirit, guide me today. Direct me today. Show me some things today. Because in my flesh, I will only see what satisfies me. 
in my flesh, I will only do the things that make me happy. But when I'm guided by the Spirit, I will give to people that I, my flesh would tell me have more than me and are standing on the side of the road, will uh, need food, and I start saying in the flesh, I'm keeping my money. But the Spirit says, you're on your way to go get something to eat. Make sure he has something to eat before you go get something to eat. My flesh rationalizes that he ought to go get a job standing out here all day long. My flesh is telling me, feed yourself. Walk by the Spirit. And when you and I are looking for a code of conduct, it has love and it is guided by the Spirit of God. He does not say run by the Spirit, skip by the Spirit, hop, jump. He says take it slow and every day walk but I'm not getting to where I want to go fast enough. But it's a better walk. It's better when you walk. Sometimes you get, you get frustrated with your progress in Christ. But let me tell you, are you still walking? That's the question. Are you still walking? Come to worship. Walk. Give unto the Lord. Walk. Live a holy life unto God. Walk. God does not have instant saints. I love instant oatmeal. Don't want to take a long time. I like the one-minute version. I want to I wanna just put some oatmeal in the boiling water, stir it, and have my oatmeal. Don't even want the three-minute version. That takes too long. I want some instant oatmeal. I know what I want each morning. I want my oatmeal. If I go to cream of wheat, I want the cream colored box one minute I don't want the red colored box that's three minutes but in the spiritual realm I've got to walk and let God take the time necessary to build up my defenses against my flesh that, that, that the problem is not other people so much, but the problem is this flesh that wants me to, to fall short of God's glory. Not before I'm saved, since I've been saved. I'm preaching to myself today that God is saying there is a war going on. It's a war against your own flesh. But you've got ammunition in the form of love directed towards others and then what the Holy Spirit does in fighting for the believer. Oh, get out. You got to tell the flesh, I'm not even going to try to fight you. Holy Spirit, take care of this. And the Holy Spirit starts bringing scripture back to your memory. That's how you fight the flesh. He starts giving you a, a recollection of all God has done for you. And then you say, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to jeopardize all of God's grace in my life by something that gives me a momentary pleasure. I don't think so. And every time you say no to the flesh, the flesh is weakened. Not totally because just when you think you've conquered the flesh, the flesh will remind you. Might be on life support, but I'm still alive. Haven't been fed in a long time, but I don't need much to eat. I feed on ego. I feed on arrogance. I feed on me, my. I feed on pride. Because when you tell me how good you are, that's a sin called pride. When you tell me where you don't go, what you don't do anymore, how you found a low-down person. And compared yourself to him or her, and then you feel good about yourself. That's called pride. See, there's no room in the believer's life for anything but you talk to the Lord. Jesus, real quick, real, real quick. Jesus said two men went to the temple to pray. He said one man was praying, Lord, I thank you. That I'm not like this publican. That's when the problem comes. The other man, the Bible says, he just beat his breast. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. 
The other one Jesus said was talking about, I don't do this, I don't do that, had his robe flowing, had the tassels dragging the ground. That's a sign of spirituality. That's that long black dress. That's that big old handkerchief in your lap. Don't sit on the front row if you got to put that big handkerchief on your lap. That's that I'm holy. That's I don't have on any makeup. I just plain Jane. I just want to love Jesus. That's no makeup, no earrings. I, it's all about Jesus. You ought to have something that adds to you, Jesus. I love Jesus, but I also know you can be stylish. <laughs> Amen. You can fix your hair. You can put some makeup on. You can shine your shoes. You can do a little bit better. And Jesus said just one went home justified. And it was the one who didn't compare himself to the other praying. Every head is bowed. Father, in the name of Jesus, teach us how freedom fights the flesh. The flesh is never satisfied. Love is the determining note in our relationship with you, O oh Lord. We must care that we bite and devour one another. We walk by the spirit and nullify the flesh. Keep meeting needs through your word. In the name of Jesus. Save today. I want to live a holy life because I want to please you, O oh Lord. When I think about how good you've been. I don't carry a code in my pocket. I don't care, carry a list of do's and don'ts in my pocket. I don't think about do's and don'ts. I think about pleasing you. I want to live a free life knowing that you are my heavenly father. That every decision I make is, will it bring honor to my heavenly father? It might be tempting to hurt someone. But that's not pleasing to my Heavenly Father. You might go somewhere and your flesh says, it's okay, you've been forgiven. But I want to please my Heavenly Father. In this moment, oh Lord, somebody is here who needs to say yes to Jesus. In this moment, someone is here who needs to acknowledge that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In this moment, as we extend an invitation, <clears throat> and Lord, I speak to someone who may be still watching, that someone today would hear that Jesus is the way. And brother, sister, with technology, if you can just let it be known that I accepted Christ as my Savior. We appeal to everyone in this audience today and wherever you're listening, radio, television, internet, this is your moment, child of God, to really speak forth. If you need a church home and you're not in Kansas City, I want you to know that we will recommend some churches. I'm pretty familiar with many cities and I can give you a list of churches in your city. God is giving us an opportunity to be a church that reaches out to the world and we give glory. But right here in Pleasant Green, I want to speak to somebody today. You've been trying to figure out what, do, what guides my life. Read through the New Testament. There's no listing of do this, do this, do this, don't do that. There's no listing. So how does a believer guide or govern his or her life? got to listen to the Holy Spirit. I, I want to tell somebody, he'll tell you sometimes, just hold your peace. I'm not through working that out. He'll speak to you sometimes. You don't know why you go left. It's more than something told me. It's the Spirit told me. There's some things that I've seen in my walk with Christ that were only revealed by the Holy Spirit. 
there have been some tight spots where only the Spirit could get you out of. And I appeal to you today, come to Jesus. If it's for prayer, come on. If you